It's good to see you, my friend. Make yourself comfortable and I will continue our tale about the legendary heroes of Waterdeep. With the skirmish over with, our heroes are saddened that they had just had to kill people they were trying to help. Our heroes sit in silence contemplating what just happened when Grid stands up and sighs, we should take them back to Waterdeep, to one of the temples and bring them back to life. Loading rubs his beard, Halaster may not be happy with that. Larilla shakes her head, he got what he wanted. I doubt he cares what happens now. Grid begins carefully picking up the bodies and asks, Lord Zorga, can we keep them in your portable hole until we get back to Waterdeep? Lord Zorga nods, indeed. That sounds like a good plan. Kaimin smiles, we should see what magic items they have first. For the moment they have no need for them. Our heroes spend several minutes checking what magic items the gentleman bastards had, and find that they had some very powerful items. Grid places each body into the portable hole, and Kaimin hands the magic items to his companions. When all seven of the bodies have been put into the portable hole, our heroes decide to have a rest. During that time, Larilla takes the seven league boots that Pelos had been wearing, and Grid takes the Teleri of Mercury that Elasha had on her feet. Kurdic also takes a couple of items and says to Lad, these are only on loan. You will have to return them when you are no longer in my service. Lad smiles, agreed. Kurdic then passes Lad the Wand of the Worm and the Ring of Perfect Discretion that Jocelyn had been using. While our heroes rest, Grid and Larilla attune to their new footwear, and Lad who only has time to attune to one of the items, attunes to the ring. Our heroes take the time to tend to their wounds, and Kurdic who still has Ilina's soul trapped, asks the cleric, do you wish to be resurrected? Ilina replies, no. Once the rest is over, our heroes decide that they should check out where the tunnel to the next level leads to, as it should lead to Dwiamakor the Wizard Academy, where Kurdic needs to enroll to take part in the High Wizard Tournament. As they head down the tunnel, our heroes are relieved to be leaving the swamp behind them. Our heroes descend down the tunnel deeper into Under Mountain. The tunnel opens upon the crumbling remains of a mansion's foyer. Our heroes are not even surprised that the Mad Mage has plucked and planted a villa in Under Mountain. Suspicious as ever, our heroes look carefully around the foyer. As they look around the room the thing that stands out the most is mosaics that line the arch ceiling depicting dueling wizards. Suddenly a severed forearm of a man that was lying on the floor rises into the air. The arm holds its palm in a stock gesture, and our heroes look at it unsure what to do. Moments later from a nearby corridor arrives the mad mage himself Halaster Black Cloak. Or at least that is what most of our heroes see. Kurdic can see through the disguise, and the approaching man is a creature the warlock does not recognize, that is magically disguised as the Mad Mage. As our heroes prepare to fight the Mad Mage, Kurdic calmly states, hold on a moment, he is not what he appears. The creature clearly in a rush continues towards our heroes, and with a slightly flustered tone shakes his head, well, it took you long enough. Hurry, damn ye hurry. You're late to your own entrance exam. Kurdic looks at the creature, who do you think we are? The creature still flustered, reaches into his pocket for a piece of paper and reads aloud, a Kurdic Rua and a loading Hemmings son. Kurdic turns to loading, and sees that the bard is as surprised as he is, that loading is due to take the exam. The creature sighs, I am relieved you finally arrived. It has been quite a stressful wait. Before our heroes have time to gather their thoughts, the creature points at Kurdic, you down that way. The creature then points at loading, and you that way. Our heroes begin to split into two groups and the creature creates an illusionary version of himself, so he can go with both groups. Kurdic, Lad, Grid, Holy Flame, Kaimin and Lady Gondafrey go with the real creature while loading, the Shield Guardian, Larilla, Max, Lord Zorga and Sephira go with the illusion. Kurdic is led to a room and on the way the creature finally takes the opportunity to introduce himself, I am the headmaster. Normally the entrance exam is more academic but we're currently at capacity. Well at least we were until some fools I call students decided to create an exam of their own that went a bit wrong. Correcting their mistake is an ideal test of your abilities, and the good news is that we now have two places available. The group arrive at a door, and the headmaster continues, beyond this door is your entrance exam Kurdic. 
You can take your minions in with you if you choose, but remember this is a test of your arcane abilities. At being called minions, Kaimin and Lady Gondafrey look displeased. Grid looks like he is about to lose his temper. Kurdic gestures for Grid to calm down, they are my companions. The headmaster nods in thought, interesting. I was a bit apprehensive about allowing non-wizards into the academy, but can now see the merits of you more charismatic arcane users. I never would have thought of calling minions companions. Grid calms down and the headmaster continues, now if you are ready. Kurdic you and your mini, companions may enter. The headmaster then opens the door, revealing a small room with a door at the opposite side, good luck Kurdic. The group enter the room and the headmaster closes the door behind them. Kurdic moves up to the door at the other side of the room, and in a chamber behind it our heroes can see some sort of devil that looks angry at being held in the chamber. Kaimin runs into the room and stands beside the devil, waiting for it to make an aggressive move. Lady Gondafrey walks into the middle of the room, and waits to see what happens. Grid roars like a bear and runs up to the devil, but does not attack it. Kurdic enters the room and holds up a small straight piece of iron and points it towards the devil. At first it looks like the warlock's hold monster spell has worked, as the devil's movement becomes sluggish and almost grind to a halt, but suddenly the devil's movement returns to normal. Holy Flame cautiously moves into the room, and Lad rushes past the elemental and throws his chain at the devil. As Lad's chain wraps around the devil restraining it, he shouts, it's some sort of bone devil. The bone devil tries to break free of Lad's chain as it tightens, but is unable to. Kaimin and Lady Gondafrey continue watching, preparing to attack, and Grid begins to swing his axe with reckless attacks, hitting the bone devil twice. Kurdic then smiles as he points at the bone devil, and it is banished with a faint popping noise as it returns to the nine hells. Our heroes spend the next minute looking around the room, to see if there is anything more Kurdic is required to do for his exam. As our heroes look around, the door to the first room opens and the headmaster walks in, welcome to Dwiamakor, the finest wizard academy in the world. As we speak a dorm is being sorted for you. Kurdic you will be part of House Kestelharp. You can have the rest of the day off and your lessons will begin at 9 in the morning. And good news, the tryouts for the school's rugby team open next week. A few minutes later the other group arrive. Loading has also passed his entrance exam, and is also part of House Kesselharp. Our heroes are led to the dormitories that have been prepared for them. Kurdic and Loading are then given the classroom number they need to go to in the morning. Our heroes spend the rest of the day exploring the campus. The dormitories themselves are large enough to house a hundred students. There is a large recreational room, with a bar at one side, that has a dartboard mounted on the wall. The other side of the room has an arch gate, decorated with images of beholders, flumps and sturges, similar to the gate our hero saw on level 6. Further into the campus there is a large dining room, a study hall, several lecture halls, a dozen classrooms, some of which have magic protections and clearly see a lot of damage from spells. There is also a decently sized library, and a doorway that would normally lead outside the villa that leads to a large cave, with a pitch for rugby and a large stand for supporters to sit. Off to one side of the pitch is a large building containing a gym, a swimming pool and a billiards table. Our heroes also notice another two arcane gates are on the campus. One has the same riddle as one of the gates in the floating castle on level 7, and the other has an open book carved into its keystone. At the time our heroes look around the campus the students are all in lessons, so they are free to make use of the recreational facilities at their leisure. The next morning there is a knock at Kurdic's door at around 8 a.m. When he answers the door there is a student standing there, wearing a uniform with the insignia of a wisp in a moonlit wood on it, the insignia for House Kestelharp. In his hand he is holding another uniform with a matching insignia. The student smiles, greetings Kurdic. Here is your uniform. Lessons start at 9. Is there anything I can help you with? Kurdic accepts the uniform and smiles, you know my name, but I don't know yours. The student bows his head, I am Jonah Wisewolf. Until you and your friend joined the house, I was the newest member. So, it is my job to give you your uniform. Is there anything else you require? Kurdic thinks for a moment, is there somewhere I can get breakfast? 
Jonah nods, yes down that way, third door on the left. The chef cooks a small selection of food for those who want a breakfast. If that is all I will be on my way. Hope you enjoy your stay. Kurdik puts the uniform on, and notices that Lad has changed his own uniform to match. Together they go for breakfast, and see that there are quite a number of students that do the same. During his brief stay in the breakfast hall, Kurdik notices that the students have uniforms with the insignias of the different houses on, and that there is not much interaction between students of different houses. To make sure he arrives at his first lesson promptly, Kurdik leaves earlier than the rest of the students in the breakfast hall. Kurdik finds the classroom that he was given the number four, and sees it is a room for brewing potions. The teacher, who is an illusion of the headmaster smiles at Kurdik, morning Kurdik. I am the teacher. Please take a seat over there. Kurdik sits down and soon after, the rest of the students begin to arrive. At 9 a.m. the teacher gets the other students started on brewing a potion of fire resistance, and then sits beside Kurdik. The teacher gives Kurdik a lesson plan, an induction book and spends half an hour explaining things about the academy. Once the teacher has finished Kurdik's induction, he gets the warlock started on brewing a potion of fire resistance. Loading has a similar induction to Kurdik, but the bard's first lesson is on necromancy, and his teacher is called Nestor, who is one of the original seven. The rest of our heroes spend most of their time enjoying the recreational facilities of the academy, but things do start to get boring for them after a few days. Both Kurdik and Loding spend the next few days attending various lessons and seminars, some taught by illusions of the headmaster, others by other teachers. During that time, they carry out various experiments, use scrolls to cast spells they don't know, learn the history of arcane magic and famous wizards, the best of which of course is one Halaster Black Cloak. The lessons are of differing degrees of difficulty, but as both Kurdic and Loading excel in their studies, they both find themselves spending more time learning harder and more complex things. Some of the students are of a similar ability to the Bard and Warlock, and that gets them wondering, why have students who clearly have the knowledge to graduate not graduated yet, when they easily could have years ago? Could it be that this place has knowledge of how to increase your powers further, and the students are holding on hoping to find that knowledge? During one break from lessons, Loading approaches Kurdic, during my time here, I have been spending more time in the library reading various books and papers from past students. I am not sure, but I think it may contain knowledge on how to beat the Scorpion Death God. Kurdic nods in thought, that sounds like some good information to find out. I need to take part in the tournament when it happens, but if you find anything out, you won't have wasted your time here, waiting for me to win the tournament or die trying. Loading laughs, if you continue to prepare for the tournament, I will spend every spare second I have in the library, looking for information. Over the next several days, Loading finds research papers of great importance, that detail how to unlock epic powers. It would appear that there are two main ways. The first is to complete a specific ritual each day for a year that differs from person to person, or be part of a group that kill a creature with mythic abilities. Of note not everyone is capable of unlocking these powers. The first step to these powers is the hardest, as killing a creature with mythic abilities is no easy task, as they have stronger resistances and immunities than normal creatures, as our heroes found out when they first fought the Scorpion Death God. To increase powers beyond the first time, requires killing stronger mythic creatures, which in some ways can be easier than the first as the strength increase closes the gap. Loading also discovers that throughout history, weapons have been created that are able to greatly harm mythic creatures, making it easier for someone to get their first kill. The bad news though, was that these weapons have been lost to time and may not be easy to find. The day after Loading reveals this information to the rest of our heroes, there is a buzz in the atmosphere of the other students. There is going to be a guest lecturer for some of that day's lessons. At breakfast the students from House Parrier seemed to have more confidence than normal. Could it be that the guest lecturer was going to be the Parrier himself? Kurdic arrives at 9 a.m. to a classroom and sees who the teacher is. It's the Scorpion Death God. Nervously Kurdic takes his seat, but the Scorpion Death God does not take much notice of any student in particular, and introduces himself, I am Mural your teacher for today. I was one of the seven. Mural then spends the lesson demonstrating a wide range of magical abilities. 
Kurdic takes the opportunity to learn as much about Mural as he can. The warlock notices that Mural is capable of easily casting multiple spells at the same time, and can even maintain concentration on more than one at a time. The lesson is finished with a demonstration of Mural's great power when he takes the students to one of the heavily protected rooms for a demonstration. When all the students are safe behind a magic field, Mural smiles, I am going to show you a powerful necromancy spell. One that normal wizards like you are likely never going to have the strength to cast. It is called Catastrophe. A goblin is pushed into the room, and as it nervously looks around at the students, Mural points a finger at it. Let's just say the results were horrific and the goblin died in a way that those who witnessed it wish they could unsee. Kurdic now knew that Loading's research was desperately needed. Our heroes have a meeting that evening and discuss what they are going to do. It is decided that Loading needs some help in the library to speed things up. Only students are allowed to use the library, but they can have a research assistant or as the sign on the library wall states, while using the library facilities students can be accompanied by one minion. It is also not frowned upon if students miss lessons to spend time in the library conducting their own studies. The next day with the help of Kaimin, Loading begins his research on finding the weapons they need. The first day's research proves fruitful, but also includes something our heroes had not considered. The weapons were not necessarily going to be on the same plane or in the same universe our heroes called home. The first reference to a location of a weapon mentions a world called Exandria. The second reference found mentions a world called Athers, and the third a world called Ratzelwelt. Getting the weapons was not going to be easy. But did you think it would be? After bringing the rest of our heroes up to speed on that day's research, Loading goes to bed quite tired but determined to continue his research. With the help of Kaimin again the next day, Loading continues his research and finds reference to a weapon in the Fey Wild, one on a world called Eberon, and one in the Nine Hells. Most of Dwarmakor's library has been searched at this point, and the following day Loading with the help of Kaimin, find the last pieces of information it contains. There is reference to a weapon on a plane called Ravnica, and another on a plane called Sigil. Our heroes were going to need a bigger library to continue their research. Loading informs the rest of our heroes, I am finished in this library. The only place I can think of with the chance of containing the information we need, is Candlekeep. Lorilla smiles, then that is where we shall go. Kurdic nods, I will remain here with Lad preparing for the tournament. Grid smiles, I will stay as well. I don't feel comfortable leaving you around so many wizards with just Lad, and I won't be much use in a library. The next day Kurdic, Grid, Lad and Holy Flame stay at Dwemakor while the rest of our heroes are teleported by loading down the Sword Coast to Candlekeep. Most of them glad to be doing something other than being bored in Dwemakor. The first day in Candlekeep was a failure, as they failed to find any information on the world of Exandria, or the weapon that could be found there. This left our heroes dejected, wondering if Candlekeep contained any of the information they needed. The next day our heroes were relieved when they found out, that the Sword of the Dragon Kings was the name of a powerful weapon that could be found on Athos. In a happier mood the following day, our heroes find out that the Crescent Blade of the Green Dragon was a powerful weapon that could be found on the world of Ratzelwelt. By now our heroes were accustomed to spending long times reading, and the next day they found out, that the Great Axe of the Heroic Champion could be found in the Fey Wilds. The day after they found out that a weapon called Valiant could be found on Eberon, the next day they found out that the Spear of Luff was in the Nine Hells, and the day after that they found out the Unbreakable Blade could be found on the Plain of Ravnica. However, research in the Library of Candlekeep was over the next morning, when our heroes find out that the Trident of the Seven Seas could be found on the Plain of Sigil. Our heroes had made great progress but still did not know where to find any of the weapons, or at least have a location narrowed down from an entire plane or world. While our heroes have lunch, loading size, we need a bigger library. I have heard rumors of one called the Alabaster Halls, but apparently it is in its own pocket dimension. Lorilla smiles, then we will find it. That afternoon our heroes do indeed find in an old book, the location of the Alabaster Halls. The problem then became how do they get there? With Library of Candlekeep exhausted, Loading teleports our heroes back to Waterdeep. The High Wizard Tournament is fast approaching, 
and Kaim in along with Lady Gondafrey decide to head back to Dwiamakor. Lord Zorga and Sephira want to see if Lady Silverhand or the Black Staff will be able to provide help getting to all these planes and worlds that our heroes are going to need to go to. Larilla and Loading decide to continue the research and to do that need to track down a wizard with the ability to get them to the Alabaster Halls who is available to hire. The next day Loading and Larilla find a wizard capable of planar travel, but hiring him is not cheap. The half-elf named Tyriac costs our heirs 1,000 dragons per day, but don't worry the cost of spell casting was covered in that cost, so long as the journey only included travel to one plane, and its return journey was a minimum of two days later. When Tyriac teleports himself along with Loading and Larilla to the Alabaster Halls, they find themselves in a labyrinthine complex of bookshelves. As they look around in awe, a strange-looking ancient dragon with spectacles on his eyes lands beside them. The dragon raises a wing to its ear, my hearing is not what it used to be so speak loudly. What brings you here? Loading smiles and speaks loudly, we are here to conduct research. Research that only your magnificent library can help us with. We are fighting a great evil and need weapons capable of harming it. We are hoping you have records of where we can find these weapons, as they have been lost to time. The dragon nods, I am Kienavaris, and my library likely will have the information you are looking for. I will allow you to use my library, on one condition. You update the records with what you find when retrieving these weapons. What they do. Who the new owner is. Anything of importance about them. Loading speaks loudly, thank you Kienavaris. That is a reasonable request. Kienavaris nods, I know it is, but there is no need to shout. During the first day of research in the Alabaster Halls, Loading and Larilla find out that a weapon called Sword of God can be found on Exandria. Now they were ready to narrow the search down to a point where they knew where to find any of, but hopefully all of the weapons. The next day they continue researching Exandria and find out that the last location the Sword of God could be found was in the royal vault of a floating city called Draconia. The second day they found out that the Sword of the Dragon Kings could be found in the city of Nibane, on the world of Athos, and that the sorcerer King Nibane had it in his private collection. The third day they find out that the leader of an organization called the Heartbreak Guild on the world of Ratzelwelt knows the location of the Crescent Blade of the Dragon. The fourth day they found out that the Great Axe of the Heroic Champion was a prize in the Witchlight Carnival in the Feywild, but that it would only be staked against something of equal value. The fifth day they find out that a noble called Dane Farscar, who lives in Highwater of the Dura district, of the city of Shan on the world of Eberon, has Valiant on display. The sixth day they found out that the Spear of Luff was on display in Avernus, and that it would be given to the bearer of a document of ownership that could be found in the archives of Dis. They also found out that traveling into and more importantly out of the Nine Hells was not easy to do, as unlike the other planes there is magic that blocks travel in and out of the Nine Hells. The seventh day they find out that the Unbroken Blade is owned by a lawyer called Gref Seastream, who lives in Plaza East of Precinct 1 on the plain of Ravnica, who keeps it locked in a safe in his home. On the eighth day, they found out that the Trident of the Seven Seas is locked in the safe of the Fortunes Will Casino in the city of Sigil in the Outlands. Most importantly, though on the last day they spend in the Alabaster Halls, it is Lorilla's birthday. Loading gives her the present that the rest of our heroes bought her. An unusual looking egg, that loading won't reveal what it contains. Lorilla puts the egg in her incubator excited for when it finally hatches. Meanwhile, back at Dwiamako all of its students have assembled in the main hall. Most of the students have a look of worry, while others have a noticeable confidence and that they know what is to come. Whispers sweep throughout the hall. Rumors claiming that someone will be put to death, or worse expelled. A clump of House Nesta students share nervous glances between themselves, as if they have some dark secret that has been discovered. Suddenly the headmaster, or is it the real Halaster Black Cloak, takes his position before a tapestry depicting the Seven. He motions for silence and when he is denied it, he polymorphs some loud-mouthed student into a sheep. The student body collectively shuts up. The silence only broken by the occasional, bar. After a few minutes, Kurdik who can see it is in fact the headmaster who smiles as he says, now that I have got your attention. The time has come around once again, the dreaded crucible, 
that harrowing trial, the High Wizard Tournament. Only the greatest Magi shall survive, and glory, power and recognition shall be theirs to claim. Behold! The headmaster claps his hand, and a goblet of cold fire thunders into existence. Eyes peer out from the flames. Eyes that hunger, that judge. The headmaster continues, to be considered for the tournament, one must cast their name into this cold fire. And any student may cast their name, but I remind our senior class, that to graduate our most esteemed academy, they must survive this crucible. Challenges Challenges three our beloved seniors face, lest they be cast aside as the trash I've always suspected them to be. Those among them too afraid to dice into the belly of the beast, may postpone their trial by yet another year, shameful as that may be. After a pause for effect, the headmaster smiles, pray to your false gods, my dear students. Those that triumph shall live forever as a graduate of Dwiamakor. But beware, my pupils. What is given cannot be taken back. The fire is impartial. The fire is your judge, and I your executioner. Death or worse, expulsion awaits those that refuse the call of the cold fire. The hall is stood in a tense silence, that is broken a few moments later by a bar. The headmaster smiles, you are dismissed for the night to mull this over. In the morning the names shall be drawn from the fire. The students begin leaving the room, and Kurdic is the only one to write his name on a piece of parchment, and cast his name into the flames at this opportunity, with the masses watching. The next morning at 9 a.m., the headmaster summons the students back to the hall. When the students are assembled the headmaster motions for silence. This time the student body shut up immediately. With a smug look the headmaster smiles, I will draw the names from the cold fire. If your name is called, come and stand here beside me. The headmaster reaches into the cold flames and draws the first name, Scriana Shadow Dusk, of House Rantanta. Scriana makes her way to the stage to the sounds of her house cheering. When she is standing beside the headmaster, he reaches into the flames again, Nihilus Jowd, of House Nesta. Nihilus makes his way to the stage, with a small cheer from his house and jeers from some of the other students. The headmaster draws the next name, Violence, of House Nightsteel. As Violence makes her way to the stage, there is a cheer from her house. The headmaster draws the next name, Turbulence, also of House Nightsteel. Turbulence makes her way to the stage with the same cheer as her sister, and the headmaster draws the next name, Spite Haradel, of House Arcturia. As Spite the twelve-year-old boy makes his way to the stage, there is a big cheer from most of the students assembled, with the odd, I hope you don't make it back, you little brat. Kurdic notices that Spite is not a twelve-year-old child, but an aging wizard using an illusion to appear much younger than he is. The headmaster draws the next name, Cephalosk, of House Mural. As Cephalosk makes his way to the stage, Kurdic notices that he is a mind flayer in disguise, which could explain why his housemates only watch coldly as he approaches the stage. The headmaster reaches into the flame and draws the next name, Elan Tanafal, of House Trobriand. There is a small cheer from his house as Elan makes his way to the stage. The headmaster draws the next name, Garibald, of House Mural. Recognizing the name, Kurdic looks his way and does indeed see Madgotha's apprentice, who escaped from the floating castle, when the wizard poisoned and then tried to kill our heroes while they slept. The headmaster then calls the next name, Castes, of House Nesta. When he does not immediately make his way to the stage, the rest of the students begin to look his way. They see him standing with his mouth open in surprise. After a moment he shouts angrily, I refuse. The headmaster snarls, then begun, Craven Kerr. You are no apprentice of mine. With an arcane word, shadowy hands appear, clawing at Castis's body. The young mage begins to scream for mercy, as his body is hurled into some dark nether whence there is no return, the fate for those expelled from Dwiamakor. When Calm has returned to the hall, the headmaster reaches into the cold flames, lastly Kurdic Rua, of House Kestel Harp. Kurdic makes his way to the stage, to a small uncertain chair from the rest of his house who seem unsure what to do. The headmaster then explains the rules of the tournament, the rules are ironically simple. Finish the task no questions asked. 
However, no competitor can back out of the tournament, one can self-forfeit a task but to quit the entire tournament will incur her laster's wrath. No competitor shall lead the academy, except for the purposes of the tournament, and they must return immediately after a challenge is complete. No competitor shall falsify their efforts or results. No competitor shall leave the region or plane of existence for that challenge of the tournament. No competitor shall turn to an otherworldly entity during a challenge unless such a being is enslaved to the will of the mage. After a leg of the tournament, all participants are given a week's rest, free from classes or chores. No competitor may interfere in the rest of another. After a moment for the competitors to take the rules in, the headmaster warns, for anyone breaking the rules, an eternity under the imprisonment spell cast by Halaster himself awaits. The headmaster then smiles, good luck to you all. Remember that a dead man can still score points, and to finish behind a dead man is a blemish that will stay with you for the rest of your own life. After explaining the rules, the headmaster shouts, courage, daring, bravado. Our opening salvo shall not disappoint, far to the frozen north, upon the roof of this blighted world, slumbers the drake Seracris, proud mother to a new clutch of eggs. I want those eggs, my dearest pupils, and I shall have them, or I shall have your heads. Dress warm, for the stolid glacier awaits. The competitors are then given some time to dress warmly, and prepare themselves for the first event. While Kurdic prepares himself there is a knock on his door. When the warlock opens it, he sees the headmaster who hand him an item, this is a beacon. Press the button on the top of it and you and up to six of your mini, companions within thirty feet of you, will be brought back here. Remember though it does not function inside the drake's lair. When all the contestants are ready, they assemble in the main hall and the headmaster teleports them to the first event. Kurdic is accompanied by Lad, Grid, Kaimin, Holy Flame and Lady Gondafrey, and they arrive on a frozen tundra. Unsure what way to go, Grid flies up into the air holding Kaimin, and together they work out the direction they need to head. As Greed and Kaimin work out the way to go, Kurdic spends some time casting a spell to give our heroes a telepathic bond, that will last until the end of the event. When they are ready to go, Grid flies toward the dragon's lair, holding the rest of our heroes. They soon reach the coast of the region and can see an entrance to the lair. Grid is concentrating on making sure he does not drop anyone, but both Kaimin and Kurdic hear a crash of thunder and see a roar of flames to the south. Not long after, Grid lands at the entrance to the lair, and the barbarian drinks a potion of heroism. Our heroes decide to leave Lad, Lady Gondafrey, and Holy Flame outside with Kaimin's broom of flying in case they need it while our heroes sneak in. As Kaimin heads inside, he can hear the sounds of a dragon snoring. Grid begins to hover and moves ahead of Kaimin into the cave. Kurdic moves up to Kaimin, and telepathically asks Grid, what do you see? Grid replies, just a corner. Kaimin stealth dashes around the corner ahead of Grid, and the barbarian flies back and picks Kurdic up, before following the rogue, who stealth dashes even further into the cave. Grid carries Kurdic and manages to keep Kaimin in sight, as they quickly and silently move through the lair, arriving at a large cavern. Kaimin arrives first and can see a sleeping ancient white dragon, and thirteen eggs around it. The rogue telepathically communicates with the others, it's huge. As Grid arrives with Kurdic, our heroes begin to formulate a plan on how they can get all the eggs, when they see three of the eggs begin to float. As they look closer, they can see the shimmer of invisible wizards carrying them. At the other end of the cavern, Spite Haradale appears holding an egg almost the size of himself. The young boy smiles as he casts a spell, and there is a clap of thunder right between our heroes and the dragon. Before our heroes can react, the dragon Seracrish begins to stir from its slumber. And sorry about this, but I am going to have to leave our tail there for the moment, as I have another customer to serve. <laughs>